um, first of all, I'm a huge welcome uh, to the next Your Employment webinar in the series, providing you with essential employment law and HR updates. And today's webinar has a special focus on settlement agreements. For those of you that are new to our webinars, we are Jones Chase, a firm of specialist employment lawyers, and we act for a number of companies from PLCs all the way through to startups, and also some fantastic individuals as well. And we have a very high success rate um, for looking after those that we represent. And we are delighted to have you with us. And I'd just like to quickly introduce um, so many of us today and the team that will be speaking to you about settlement agreements. So we've got one of the firm's partners, Shona. Hello, good afternoon. And um, one, uh, one of the firm's paralegals, Dominic. Good afternoon. Uh, senior associate, Harriet. Hi, everybody. Another senior associate, Carl. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And finally, uh, last but not least, um, another, another associate. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, we got a promotion there. Hello, everyone. <laughs> That's not the first time that's happened, actually, is it? So, you know, it's because you're doing so well. That's why. Okay. Um, right. In terms of the format for the webinar, if you want to ask us questions, please use the Q&A box. If you want to do that anonymously, please hit the anonymous button. Also, you can use the chat box as well. Uh, just a, a, an important note, we are recording the webinar because um, a number of people uh, um, that want to see this and can't make it at uh, four o'clock today. So um, if you want to ask questions, um, please do so on an anonymous basis. So use the Q&A box and hit the anonymous button. I should emphasize that the information that we're covering today is accurate um, as of the 28th of July, 2022. Things are always changing in employment loss. Drop us a line if you have any further questions. And we have an awful lot of content to cover today, but everyone's time is precious. We'll do our best to finish at five o'clock. And lastly, if you find our content useful, or if you, um, if you or your company need, need any legal help, or if you know of anyone else that would find these webinars or our content useful, um, definitely get in touch, or um, otherwise um, feel free to recommend us to other people. And we can reach us by using info at joneschase.com and the rest of our contact details uh, can be found on joneschase.com as well. So um, again, as I mentioned, we have an awful lot of um, uh, topics uh, or subtopics about settlement agreements to go through. So I'm just going to hand over to Zainab, who's going to be dealing with the first topic, which is what's the difference between a settlement agreement and an ACAS COT3. So over to you, Zainab. Steam. So I'm actually going to start with what are the, what's the same things with the COT3 agreement and assessment agreement. So they're both written agreements. They're both intended to settle and resolve potential employment law complaints that have been bought or potentially could be bought in an employment tribunal or a court by employees or workers. I'm going to refer to employees in this, but it's applicable to workers as well generally. So what are the two differences between these two types of agreements? What, sorry, what are the key differences? There's more than two differences between these two types of agreements. So a COT3 can only be achieved with the involvement of ACAS. In most cases, it's used as a precursor to issuing employment tribunal claims. It's compulsory now to register with ACAS for early conciliation prior to putting a claim in. So what ACAS will do is that they'll attempt to resolve a potential employment dispute to avoid the need for formal recourse to an employment tribunal. If a resolution can be reached, it will often be evidenced in a COP3 agreement. And the name actually derives from the fact that it used to be called Central Office of Tribunals Form 3, which I learned today, fun fact. Whereas a settlement agreement is a legally binding contract between an employee and an employer, where in return for consideration, usually financial, the employee agrees to enter the agreement and waive their rights to take the employer to court for any claims they may have arising from their employment or the termination of their employment. It can be used in circumstances where the, a claim has already been begun in an employment tribunal and, and part of this part of the uh, settlement agreement can say that the, the claim will be withdrawn, but you generally want to use a COT3 for that. So COT3 doesn't have to include anything in particular to be legally binding, whereas a settlement agreement has to comply with certain provisions of law in order to be legally uh, binding. So that includes the individual has to have taken independent advice as to the terms and effect of the agreement from a relevant independent advisor. So for example, that could be a solicitor or a certified trade union advisor. The agreement must be in writing. The agreement must identify the particular claims the employee or worker is waiving, but will also include all possible claims the employee could bring. Their legal advisor must be named in the agreement. The legal advisor has to have a professional indemnity insurance, which is usually held by the firm. And the agreement must contain a statement confirming that the conditions I've just mentioned have been complied with, okay? 
So a COT3 agreement is usually in a much shorter format than a settlement agreement, as it's usually settling claims that already exist, and so the matters are a little bit more contained, whereas a settlement agreement will usually be a lengthy agreement, and I'm sure you've seen some that span pages and pages, and they anticipate, anticipate claims that haven't yet been started, um, and they can place a bit more of an onerous obligation on employees. That's not to say that COT3 agreement is less effective when it's used in the right circumstances. And personally, any COT3 agreements we draft as a firm will look to waive you know, claims that um, an employee can bring in the COT3, as well as what we would include in the settlement agreement. So a COT3 agreement is binding once emails are sent to ACAS by either side saying, yeah, I agree, even before it is signed. When you get to the signature stage with a COT3, it can be signed by the parties themselves or by their representatives if they are if the parties are legally represented. Whereas settlement agreements usually have to be signed personally and they have to be signed by both parties before they are binding. And the certificate has to be completed by the lawyer who's advising the individual as well. So ACAS is a mutual organization and they can't give advice on the preferred terms of a COT3 agreement. Whereas I'm sure you've all encountered difficult lawyers on the other side of a settlement agreement because they are negotiating on behalf and on the, in the, for, for the interests of their, um, their client. Uh, with a COT3, both parties usually bear their own costs, even if they are legally represented, where it's quite usual with a settlement agreement for an employer to contribute a small amount towards the employee's legal fees for seeking the advice on the terms and effects of the agreement. Um, and COT3 can be used where there is a live dispute or live proceedings in which ACAS can conciliate, or the employee can even get ACAS involved directly to let them know that there may be a, dis a dispute which needs to be resolved. Whereas a settlement agreement can be used at any time during the employment relationship or after the relationship has come to an end. If a dispute is resolved in the employment tribunal on the day of the hearing, this is really common. Um, usually after you've just decided that you're going to read into the papers, all the work's been done. Um, for practical reasons and due to time constraints, usually a short COT3 agreement would be completed through ACAS for speed, um, and it's likely to prove prove less problematic than seeking to draw up a settlement agreement and obtain independent advice on those terms. So those are the key differences between a COP3 agreement and settlement agreements. Okay, that, uh, that's great. So then we haven't had any questions yet. So because we have a lot of content today, I'm just going to move straight on to Harriet's section. And Harriet's going to speak about two things. Uh, firstly, common arguments raised on the terms of a settlement agreement and also how um, companies or employees should deal with the confidentiality aspects of settlement agreements. So over to you, Harriet. Thank you, Dean. Um, so um, you know, as Zainab has said, you know, if you have um, a settlement agreement that you're offering to one of your employees, uh, you'll be advising them that they, they need to take um, some form of, of legal advice from a you know, solicitor or trade union representative, um, as Zainab has explained. Um, and therefore, you may get some pushback on some of the clauses in the agreement. Um, this may come from the individual directly before they've even had advice or, or potentially once they've, they've got the advice. And it can sometimes be on clauses that you think are quite standard that you wouldn't necessarily have thought there should be um, an issue with. Um, so we thought it would be useful just to look at some of the points that we uh, we see commonly raised by individuals, uh, just to look at well, why are they raising this issue and, and what the responses um, to these arguments could be and how to deal with it. So the first one I wanted to, to look at was the argument um, that sometimes we hear you can't settle future claims and this carries on from what Zainab was was mentioning in terms of what type of claims might you want to be waiving in a settlement agreement. Um, so as Zainab's touched on, we would obviously want to cover any specific complaints that an employee may already have raised in discussions. So this may not be that, that they've actually brought a tribunal claim, but they may say, I consider that you've discriminated against me or I believe my dismissal was unfair. So you can cover those off um, clearly. And then we'd also cover any claims that may have already arisen, even if the employee hasn't actually specifically raised them. And then the widest form of settlement, which we would always want to try and cover, is any claims which may arise in the future whether or not the employee is currently aware of them and obviously you want this because as an employee you want to try and have reassurance that the employee isn't going to, to pop up later down the line and bring any other types of claim um, which may arise and Don will be looking at this a little bit later on what happens after the settlement agreement has been signed but we want it to try and be as comprehensive as possible and 
legally there's been quite a lot of debate about whether it's actually technically possible to waive future claims um, but the view that is generally that it is possible that the agreement just needs to be absolutely clear in its wording that this is what was intended so it won't automatically be the case that future claims are waived but we need to be really clear in the settlement agreement so this is something you might want to have a look at it if you do have a template settlement agreement but you'd be wanting wording that will say things like you know any claims or rights of action uh, whatever wherever however uh, may arise you directly or indirectly um, out of the employment or its termination and then you want to be saying you know whether or not these claims and the circumstances giving rise to them are or could be known to the parties or even in their contemplation at the date of the agreement in any jurisdiction so if you've got some wording that's really clear like that then you you can weigh future claims um but as i say you know have a have a check of your uh, your template settlement agreement and see if you've, you've got that clear wording um and so it's definitely something that you can push back uh, to the employee if they raise that um, another another sort of point we often uh, get is um, uh, the, the individual or, or their advisor saying, my client's not going to give a tax indemnity. Um, now, the reason that as an employee, you would want a tax indemnity in the settlement agreement is to provide some protection for the company in the event that HMRC uh, decides to pursue it for any further tax or employee national insurance contributions on the termination payment. So usually you're paying some or all of a, of a termination payment free of these deductions to the employee. This doesn't cover employer national insurance contributions, of course. Um, and we would certainly not advise uh, agreeing to remove a tax indemnity um, as otherwise the company will, will be stuck with that liability if it, if it arises. So, you know, we would be suggesting that, um, you know, you should push back on this and, Usually employees will agree to have the tax indemnity in the settlement agreement when push comes to shove, because the alternative that you can present to them is that you pay the termination payment with tax and employee national insurance contributions already deducted, uh, and the employee can then look to reclaim the tax from HMRC. Uh, and this is usually a worse prospect for an individual. Um, so normally we, we would get them to sign up to the tax indemnity. Um, but it is OK usually to, to agree some revisions to the clause uh, if the employer requests them, um, depending on how it's worded. So, for example, things that we might uh, agree to which are commonly raised are um, the indemnity usually says uh, you indemnify the company for any interests or penalties that may arise. And it's it's usually reasonable to exclude uh, those which arise due to any default or delay on the part of the employer uh, with appropriate wording. Um, and also you can agree to give the employee a uh, reasonable notice of, of any demand for tax and reasonable access to any documents that they may need to dispute the demand. So usually by uh, giving giving something on the wording, you can normally get the, uh, the, the tax indemnity agreed. Um, and the last point I was going to cover, which is quite quite a broad point, um, is when, when employees say, well, why are you imposing all these restrictions on me, uh, potentially sometimes when there are none in my contract or, or there may be some, um, and employees often get very concerned about this and, and some of the points I'm going to raise are sometimes the things that you spend the most time debating when you're trying to finalise the settlement agreement, sometimes not, not even the figure that we're talking about. Um, so the one to, to look at firstly, which can cause um, some issues, is the confidentiality of, of the actual agreement itself. So sometimes this would cover the existence of the agreement, uh, the terms of the agreement and the circumstances giving rise to the agreement and or the termination of employment. And sometimes employees say, well, I don't want to sign anything that, that you know, uh, limits my ability to say anything at all. Um, but obviously, from the employer's perspective, uh, quite a lot of the benefit of signing this kind of agreement and giving the employee compensation is so kept confidential. So I think, you know, we can be quite um, sort of uh, bullish on that point to say, well, you know, no confidentiality, no deal. Um, so normally employees will agree to some form of confidentiality. Um, and you can also look to make it retrospective to say that they confirm that they have already kept uh, these matters confidential and will agree to, to keep doing so. Um, the, the slight caveat to this is you need to be a little careful, particularly when you're settling claims relating to any workplace harassment or discrimination. And there's been a lot of discussions in, in, um, in the public arena as I'm sure you're aware of about, of about the use of um, what people call NDAs, so non-disclosure agreements, uh, particularly in these types of cases. So 
it's now sort of fairly sort of standard practice and good practice to include a list of exclusions to, to confidentiality restrictions so that you're going to allow the, um, the employee to discuss matters with obviously their, their professional advisors, uh, potentially sort of medical or, or counselling professionals, um, their immediate family or spouse or partner. Um, in this case, you want to ensure that there's an obligation on these individuals to keep the matters confidential as well. Um, and importantly, you know, there's normally an exclusion to, to make protected disclosures. So if they need to, to blow the whistle, reporting criminal offences to the police, saying anything to, to HMRC or the regulator about the agreement and obviously as required by law or as required by a court order. So if you've got those kind of exclusions in the settlement agreement, I think um, an employee's objections to, to confidentiality should, uh, should, be, should be limited. But what about the flip side? Um, you know, should you as, as the employer promise to keep you know, the fact and terms of the settlement agreement confidential on behalf of all of your officers and employees? Um, and this is very often how the confidentiality clause is, is drafted. And you may be agreeing to this without really quite thinking about it. So it may say something like the parties confirm that they shall keep these things confidential, uh, in which case it, it applies to the employer as, a, as an entire organization. So, you want to think a little bit carefully about this, because can you really agree on behalf of your whole organisation that matters will be kept confidential? Um, probably not. You know, if one person were to breach this, then, then the company would be in breach of the agreement. So what, what we'd often advise is that um, a, sort of a halfway house, so you, you can just say, no, the company's not going to agree to confidentiality, uh, which may not go down very well. But a, a compromise is to say that the company will instruct certain named individuals to keep the matters confidential. Um, and this could be limited to those who are aware of the agreement, um, those that need to process the payments, um, or often it's the employee's line manager, perhaps someone from HR. So that way, once a company has done the instructing, they can't otherwise be in breach um, and those who need to be told are limited in number. So this is usually a really good way to, uh, to deal with that. Um, another common restriction, which often you see following after the confidentiality is um, non-disparagement. So there'll be a clause that says that neither party will make any adverse or derogatory comments you know, about the other um, or do anything that may bring them into to disrepute. Um, sometimes employment contracts already include this type of restriction. So you might want to check the wording of your contract. If not, it's, it's usually helpful to include this in the settlement agreement, mainly just as a warning shot to the employee to be careful about what they say about the organisation and its people after they leave. Obviously, in this age of, of social media, uh, it's, it's far too easy for somebody to say something um, that they later regret about their, their ex-employer and, and certain individuals. So I think just making it clear to them that, that this is not OK is very sensible. Um, and such a clause is usually subject to the kind of exclusions that I've, I've just mentioned in terms of employee being able to speak freely uh, to limited people such as their professional advisors, your close family, etc. Um, and obviously, if you are going to agree to, um, to this kind of obligation on the part of the company, um, think about limiting this um, as I've just set out to instructing certain named individuals. I'm afraid my light's just gone off. Just give me one second to go and put it back on. Apologies. Um, yeah, I think I shouldn't take too long to do that. But no, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> I was, I'm just going to mention something about confidentiality, but do carry on. That's fine. Oh, OK, no, no worries. Sorry, these uh, automatic lights, they're saving energy. Um, uh, just a couple, couple more points. Um, just to say, if your contract of employment doesn't contain an express confidentiality clause uh, or it's not very comprehensive, you might want to uh, include a general confidentiality clause in your settlement agreement. Um, otherwise, just be aware that after the end of employment, uh, protection only applies to information which is so confidential that it amounts to a trade secret. So you would normally want some more detailed form of, of confidentiality. Or if you have decent clauses in your, in your contract of employment, just refer back to those clauses just to remind the employee and make clear that they survive um, termination of employment. And just quickly, the last type of um, restriction could be uh, post-termination restrictive covenants. So Often you're going to refer back to the employee's contract to say um, you remain bound by the uh, post termination restrictions that are already in your contract. However, if you if you don't have any in the contract or you're actually looking to introduce new ones, these are much harder to justify uh, than the restrictions that I've just talked about, because the employee may well say and um, probably fair enough if. If these really were legitimate and justifiable, why were they not already in my contract? Um, and you may see termination 
as an opportunity to get the employee to sign up to new ones. Um, but, you know, I suspect that we get quite a lot of pushback to that and they may ask for, for, for more money in return um, or say, you know, I'm just not willing to, to agree to those kind of restrictions, particularly a, a non-compete. Um, I would just guard against restating the full restrictions in your contract, because if you have any drafting errors, that's that's going to cause problems. So um, just just generally refer back to the contract. And just to, just to say, it's usually a good idea to allocate some specific uh, consideration, i.e. a small sum of money to these types of restriction if they're not mutual. Um, for example, you know, £100 subjects to deductions. Um, otherwise, there's an argument that there isn't actually a con valid contractual agreement uh, if the employee is not getting anything in return, for example, um, not making any derogatory statements. Um, uh, and certainly you should do this for any post-termination restrictions. And my very last point, is that you would uh, ideally want to state in the settlement agreement that, that these types of restriction are a condition of the settlement agreement. Um, if you don't state they're a condition of the settlement agreement, then you won't be entitled to withhold uh, the settlement payments to the employee if they do breach them. So for example, you'd want to say subject to and conditional on you complying with the terms of the agreement or these specific clauses, we will pay you um, these sums of money, et cetera. Uh, I shall pause there because I know there's a lot of things other people want to say, so thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, I had a few things to say as well, but, but I think there's so much to go through today, so we'll, we'll just move on quickly to, to share on the section. So thanks very much, Harriet. No questions from anyone today, um, just slightly unusual, but okay, that's all good. And um, okay, so moving on to share on the section, which is um, Sharon will discuss um, steps on setting the amount of offer and the impact of future negotiations in relation to the same. So over to you, Shona. Yeah, so the majority of the settlement agreement is uh, legalistic, as as Zainab described um, at the outset. And uh, the bottom line is usually for the company and the individual with whom they're settling is what they're going to offer. And um, of that what, how much? And Zainab referred to the fact it was usually financial. And so this how much becomes quite a critical point in the settlement agreement itself. And what the company is paying for is that peace of mind of, of no more claims. That's what it hopes. And what the individual is hoping for is a sum of money that actually reflects what claims that individual believes they have against the organization. And so at the outset, as a company, I'd always recommend that you think through the uh, allegations or assertions that the individual is making against the company and how much those are actually worth in terms of legal claims. Um, and then having determined how much those are worth, uh, the, the likelihood of success of those allegations turning into something that amounts to a claim and that amounts to a successful claim against the organization. So that you have a, an understanding of what this is worth legally. And, and that's only one factor. There's, there's no exact science to this, but it's just things to think of uh, at each stage. So it's the assertions that the individual is making and the likelihood of success of those assertions or allegations. Um, and then having decided that, you also have to take into account what this is going to cost if indeed this individual decides that they will pursue this to a claim or has already pursued it to a claim and is galloping along with that claim in the employment tribunal. It's the likelihood of them carrying on with that or the likelihood of it starting in the first place. And then the likelihood, as I've said, of the success of those uh, particular claims that the individual is asserting and the cost of defending those, which includes not only legal costs, but also management time. So at the outset of thinking about settlement, and even if this is at the stage where you're having a protected conversation, where the employee is still in your employment, and you're deciding, actually, we want to suggest settlement to this individual to leave, uh, or else it will be this. Even at that stage, thinking through why you've even got to the point of having a protected conversation with the individual, it's worth thinking the types of claim that that individual could assert against you and the merits of those claims, how much that is worth, and therefore that affects the how much would you offer financially. Now, it could be that financially you don't believe that the individual is either likely to bring a claim or uh, has brought a claim but has no likely prospect of success, in which case then the financial offer 
could be we will not pursue you for our costs if indeed you pursue with this claim against us. So it could be that you're not actually paying a monetary sum, but you're saying to the individual, but we won't uh, uh, assert our costs against you if you get through to the employment tribunal stage or, or hearing. It could be that the financial payment is an amount where, again, you don't think there's a likelihood of the individual success, but commercially, that you would rather pay it to the individual than to the lawyers in uh, arguing this, and therefore it's an amount of money that recognises that cost to you, obviously discounted, uh, in order to make it an attractive figure for the um, individual. So. Uh, on a, from a financial perspective, um, the main driver is the assertions and allegations that the individual is bringing against you and the likelihood of success. Um, another driver can be tax. Uh, there's a 30,000 limit um, that says for loss of offers, and if it's a genuine loss of offers, uh, there can be a tax-free payment ex gratia, so it's not pursuant to the contract the notice period or any other contractual payment, it's purely outside the contract and ex gratia uh, below that figure of 30,000 can be paid tax free. Um, and you may decide that actually, if it's a very senior executive, we'll, we'll use that 30,000 as our gauge in, in what to offer. Um, another uh, uh, factor that can be driving this is, is regulatory issues that come about uh, on settlement. For some organisations, particularly charities, they have to disclose what settlement payments they have paid throughout a financial year. That has to be disclosed in their charitable accounts. And they don't want to be seen to have large figures in those charitable accounts that are being given to an ex-employee rather than being used for charitable purposes. So check that there are no regulatory obligations for these uh, this amount of money that you're considering offering to be placed in, in a public place. So I've said the how much is very much on the basis uh, as an employer in negotiating your only way is up. As an employee uh, negotiating or an ex-employee, their only way is down. And so whatever you start with, uh, do you put in wriggle room with that starting point? Um, is there logic to what's being offered? And based on that, uh, what am I putting forward as my first amount? And then it's the language that you use for putting that across. Um, it could be that the individual uh, rounds everything up, does lump sums, talks in, in, in total figures, and you have been separating out figures and being very, precise as to what you're paying for what type of allegation, et cetera. Um, and it may be that changing those breakdown figures into a total sum, the, end, the other side will start uh, negotiating more effectively with you because you're using their terminology and they can understand that it's a lump sum um, rather than breaking things down and they think we're hiding something in that break time. So again, the language that you use can be quite important in, in how this is put forward. But the whole joy of settlement agreements over and above claims is that you can be more creative with settlement than just how much or what's the monetary value of this. You can think about other aspects of uh, an offer to the individual that they may believe to be uh, more attractive to them than just a monetary sum. Uh, that is outplacement. Um, you can also actively participate in helping the individual to uh, find alternative work outside your organization, practice interviews, uh, helping them find um, alternative jobs that on a job search, they may not have a clue how to go about that, may have been in their job for quite some time, and you're assisting them, and particularly within HR, in helping them find another job. There's also some people may would prefer a longer period of time in employment, maybe spent on garden leave, but a period of time where they remain employed rather than a short period of, uh, we're settling this, you're now going, and I'm, they're now an ex-employee. They may wish to take part of the money as a monthly payment and remain in employment because they think they'll be able to get another job in employment rather than out of it. Uh, you might offer a reference over and above a factual reference. And a factual reference is not a compulsory thing to be given. That's again a negotiating point, but uh, we may give a, a, a nicer reference over and above factual. I have to say as an employer, you're often quite wary of flowery 
beyond factual references because you think, well, this is this has been part of a settlement to get something so lovely. You may even think of an apology and go as far as saying we're sorry that. Um, and that can be worth a lot to an individual. Uh, you may decide, I've had one settlement where an individual wanted um, a room in a building, uh, one of the conference rooms named after them <laughs> for uh, their legacy. Uh, you know, co costs nothing. Um, you may not want to look at the name of that room every day, but it is something that's over and above the financial uh, element to settlement. Um, company property, an individual may want to keep their company phone number or they might they want to keep their company laptop. Do make sure that things are wiped uh, before anything is handed over. They may wish to keep their company car, make sure all fines are reconciled and paid by the time. But again, you can think uh, outside what a tribunal will offer, which is uh, a monetary payment from a tribunal. Um, medical care. Uh, can also be part and parcel of settlement, um, a continued uh, um, uh, membership uh, for medical, for BUPA, uh, whatever. And um, you may decide that uh, you'll waive your restrictive covenants. I know Harriet's just discussed about keeping restrictive covenants or repeating them and or having new restrictions in the settlement, but you may decide actually we can waive the restrictive covenants in an already existing employment contract and that is worth something to the individual. But when you are offering up these things, it, it, it's a package. So um, rather than things uh, being asked for by the individual in a drip drip fashion, because often the individual will agree the monetary sum and then you get all these extra drips drip as requests for this, that and the other, pin it all down all at the same time as part of your negotiating package, because then you can say, well, actually that's worth X. And so financially your package is much greater than, than the one anticipated or the one that's set down as the X gracious payment. Um, I just want to just talk slightly about the tax. The other element of tax uh, is tax clearance. So if you're making a payment uh, that's over 30,000, it could be for ill health and you um, can pay that as a total tax repayment for ill health, uh, an individual leaving your employment. And that isn't limited to the 30K tax free. I would always recommend that you take tax clearance on a settlement agreement of that kind. And both parties agree that they'll jointly apply for that clearance with the revenue before the amount is uh, agreed finally. So that's another way of, of, of dealing with the 30,000 element. So it's making sure that um, you are uh, speaking the language the other side understands and you've assessed what it is they could bring as a claim. Now, part of the problem is dealing with a delusional individual who thinks that their claim is absolutely marvellous and uh, is worth much more than the amount that you're getting. And in that instance, you will have to explain the logic behind your offer and point out what the law is and therefore why the merits of your defence far outweigh the merits of their claim. Um, you can also get to a stage where there's high levels of acrimony between the two parties and um, you can't actually get through to the other side, either at employee employer level or even solicitor to solicitor level when a claim is brought and both sides just can't uh, uh, due to levels of acrimony or uh, agree a settlement. And then you might consider bringing in a third party to say, look, I know you don't believe anything I'm saying to you about the merits of your claim, but here's a third party, a mediator, for example, that we're bringing in that will help mediate between the two parties to reach that settlement if the, uh, it's so acrimonious that, uh, that neither side will budge. But the whole point of the settlement is that um, everyone walks away feeling that they have got something out of it that is useful to them. And that also from a company point of view, you have settled something uh, to the right value based upon the claims brought. Be wary of settling all points though, because then you get a reputation for settling and individuals, whether they've got a claim or not, will want to assert they do because they know it's worth something. So you have to be very, very wary about uh, being known as, as, as the soft touch and the settler. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, that, that's great, Shona. Um, I've made a lot of notes. There's a few things we can quickly run through as a team at the end of the webinar, but I just want to make sure we get through all these sort of um, the pre arranged people first. So thank you very much for that. And now we're going to move on to Carl, who's going to discuss um, the possible implication of LTIP. So over to you, Carl. Thank you, Dean. Um, well, um, 
LTIP, for those who may not be familiar with the term, stands for long-term incentive plan and the actual design and structure of a, a long-term incentive plan can vary depending on what type is adopted by the employer. Um, uh, and so they, they are in their design and architecture, they do vary. Um, the typical ones that I've seen um, as an employment lawyer are ones that provide um, a nil cost option, i.e. the employee is an option holder um, and that they're entitled to uh, exercise an option to then acquire shares. And essentially the, the shares are free for the employee. The employee hasn't had to pay any of their own money to acquire those shares. Another type of LTIP I've seen is a conditional share award or performance shares where the um, conditional shares are not delivered to the participant of that type of LTIP until the conditions specified in the um, plan rules have been achieved. And another type of LTIP that I've seen in the past has been a restricted shares um, uh, award. Um, where the shares are delivered to the participant when the award is made. However, those shares are forfeitable um, in the event that um, the conditions are not met or achieved. Um, so one can't assume that one LTIP is identical to another, they do vary, um, and uh, they won't be available to all employees that you may be seeking to settle by means of a settlement agreement. Um, it, 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 often LTIPs are offered to senior executives or managers, um, but uh, that does depend because some employees I've come across um, um, do offer a, a low level of sort of share awards for, for um, low level, lower level or mid-ranking managers. Um, now, when I advise executives about this, um, some on, in some instances, um, the majority of the value um, for the executive is rests in the LTIP planned itself in the, in the valuation of the shares or the predicted future value of those shares and actually what's less valuable to them is the cash sum of money uh, that's going to be paid on an ex-gratia basis um, um, and so their laser focus is on the extent to which they can um, secure the, the rights they believe they're entitled to or actually improve upon those rights as a participant in an LTIP by means of using the settlement agreement. So a settlement agreement once entered into by both parties is a contract in law and so it has contractual effect. Um, and it, it is possible for a settlement agreement to um, actually improve upon the treatment of the participant under an LTIP, um, provided the uh, employer is going to agree to that. Um, or, 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 uh, and in addition, actually set out the way in which um, any discretion that's reserved in an LTIP will be exercised in the um, executive's favour um, and, and for that, that wording to be set out in the settlement agreement. Um, now, um, no, in my experience, that tends to be minority of situations. Um, typically, the approach that one sees adopted by employers um, when it comes to what wording to put in the second agreement in relation to LTIPs it, it is one of three principal approaches. The first approach is that the um, employer will carve out entirely the, in, um, the effects of the long-term incentive plan rules. So the in settlement agreement, so settlement agreement will, will say in various sections throughout the document that none of its provisions or waiver of any claims relates to any claim that the employee may have in relation to the interpretation of their rights under the long term incentive plan or the assertion of their rights under the long term incentive plan. That's position sort of A. Position B is that the employer agrees in the second agreement wording to the effect that they will make a recommendation to the remuneration committee, either of that entity or some other entity that is a, a party to the LTIP, um, that the employee will be a good lever um, uh, and, and um, with, the, with, the, with the consequential follow-up, follow-on, that the employee's treatment under the LTIP will be better than it would be if they were deemed to be a bad lever. Um, and the, that's option B. And option C is that the employer um, brings in another group company as a co-signatory to the settlement agreement, where that other group company um, is, the, is the main company, company that has granted shares to the executive. Um, now, uh, the reason for that is that um, an LTIP could be entered into between a, a sort of parent company and the executive, even though the employment contract states that the executive is employed by a subsidiary of the parent company. So there are different contractual relationships going on in the different documents and the employee will want to, um, uh, uh, and so, so the, the uh, say our client, the executive's employer is unable to commit to a certain position under the LTIP document because they're not a signatory to the, to the, to the LTIP. So you have to look at who the contracting parties are, 
um, in an LTIP, you have to look at whether there are any good lever or bad lever provisions. And typically, a good lever is someone who is, is someone whose dismissal is brought about by reason of their redundancy. That's seen as a non-blameworthy cause for dismissal, or, or ill health, or, 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 or disability-related issues, or retirement. Um, and a bad lever can sometimes be defined as any other type of dismissal, uh, or it can be circumscribed to be um, uh, various types of reasons for dismissal, such as gross misconduct or, or, or capability that's not related to ill health or, or resignation. Um, and typically, um, good levers will um, be permitted to retain a portion of their shares under an LTIP, especially those that have already vested at the date of the termination of their employment. And it may well be that, they, that the other shares that haven't yet vested at the date of termination are accelerated um, and, and, and uh, so that they get more shares than they otherwise would have if um, if they weren't treated as a good lever, and the settlement agreement can reflect that if the parties if, if the parties agree to the wording of that. Um, with bad levers, it's the worst scenario for an, an individual because typically the treatment on the shares is that they forfeit all their shares. Um, it, it, it can be that they forfeit their shares that have actually vested and will lose those that have not yet vested. It does depend on the wording of the of the each LTIP document. Um, so um, a lot of value can lie in this, um, especially where you have a large employer, a very large employer, um, um, uh, uh, which may actually be a listed company, or it may be an AIM, an alternative investment market company, um, or a, a quickly growing employer um, that um, is um, sort of like, you know, like a rocket young company that is actually um, getting lots of investment in and is doing really well and is on a, a, a large growth trajectory um, where the executive and um, one of the reasons why they signed up and joined that company in the first place was they were granted shares it was one of the major draws to them joining that company they then don't want those shares to sort of disappear and was like an Alice in Wonderland benefit you go to reach for it and it disappears in, in, in your grasp um, and um, so 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 it can be an area of dispute um, what matters for some employees is um, that they you give careful consideration to when the next vesting of shares will be, because it might incentivize the employee to request a deferred, a, a delayed termination date as part of settlement negotiations, because they want the next tranche of shares to vest. Um, it, 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 it could be that if the employer says, no, we're not going to agree to that, that that has an impact on the strategy that the employee adopts, which is that they go off sick. Um, to try and delay their dismissal, or that they submit a detailed grievance um, about their treatment in order to try and delay their dismissal dates. So every action has a sort of reaction sometimes with these things. Um, and um, um, the other thing is with LTIPs in terms of how it can impact on the settlement agreement is that obviously depending on whether option A, B or C is adopted that I've, that I've already discussed, um, there may well be provisions in, in an LTIP dealing with malice and clawback. So malice, a situation where it's almost opposite to a bonus, really, where some some sort of um, wrongdoing has been discovered that the individual has to, it, it forfeits their entitlement to, to future shares, um, or a clawback provision whereby they're held to have done something wrong, they concealed, didn't bring to the attention of their employer, and that they have to pay back some money that has been transfer converted into the form of shares. So they have to sort of pay those shares back, transfer those shares back. The employee may want to try and improve their position on the settlement agreement to, to remove the malice or clawback provisions. And that all does depend, again, on the extent to which the company, as the employer, uh, uh, or, or not just the employer, but the party to the LTIP document, the extent to which they're prepared to amend um, the provisions of their, of their LTIP documents in a settlement agreement. It is rare to see um, often that the employer will understandably adopt the position that, that this is something that we roll out to, to many other executives who are unprepared to make a, a, an, an improved position for your individual client. And where, and where we act for employers in settlement agreements where LTIPs are involved, um, it really does help to get your house in order. Um, for example, if you're pr proposing in terms of settlement to a very senior individual who has the resources and connections to go and get legal advice, um, then um, have in advance prepared uh, so almost like a Q&A document something explaining what the typical treatment of the individual shares will be depending on the category of them as a lever i.e good lever bad lever or intermediate status sometimes there's an intermediate lever status as well um, uh, and explain then w w under each category of lever what, what they should do next by certain deadlines and have all that information in one document can be very very useful 
Um, if you don't do it that way, and the executive is unsure about how what can be quite complicated documents operate on, on their shares, they are likely then to seek legal advice, which will increase their own costs, and they are likely as part of settlement to request that their the legal contribution you pay to them on the second agreement is increased from the typical standard figure of 500 to 750 pounds plus VAT. Now, whether you agree to that as a matter of commercial negotiation, but 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 the executive may be quite emotionally upset, emotionally if you if you haven't actually explained to them how the company proposes to treat their shareholding uh, at a time when you're actually asking them to leave the business. Okay, that's great. And I'm just checking, Carl, um, nothing further to cover from yourself at the moment. Uh, that's the end of your section, is that right? Uh, um, yes, I mean, um, I don't, uh, it's, uh, it, I have nothing else specifically to comment okay. on. Yeah. Let's go to just check in before I sort of cut you off quite rudely. Yeah. That's, just, that's all good. Okay, um, and, and thanks very much for that. That was great. Um, moving on to the final uh, section of the webinar. Which is quite appropriate and um, beautifully timed. So Dominic's going to speak about what happens when you sign this uh, a settlement agreement. Is that the end of the matter, or could an employee still bring claims? So over to you, Dominic. Thank you, Dean. So as Dean mentioned, looking at whether a settlement agreement, once signed by both parties and the employees or ex-employees lawyer, now looking is that the end of the matter, or can there be claims by the employee despite a signed settlement agreement? So firstly, the short answer is yes, there can be future claims. And the longer answer is the general effects and principles of settlement agreements in relation to future claims are limited, but there is still a risk. And what I'll do is I'll cover how a company can limit those risks and the need to be cautious. And then finally providing some helpful tips for employing companies. So the first principle that I'll look at today is the intention of a settlement agreement is to bring the dispute between the employee and the employer and any proceedings that have been started to an end. So the first principle can be varied if the parties to the settlement agreement, which are the employer and the employee, have agreed as part of the settlement terms that certain claims can be started by the employee post-settlement. But the first principle is in place because the effect of the settlement is to prevent the parties from taking any further claims without the order of a court. So the second principle is that the settlement agreement should clearly cover all the possible claims the employee could bring and or has brought against the employer and all associated or group companies of the employer. So if the parties and particularly the employer has failed to deal with a specific type of claim in the settlement agreement terms, which could and or should have been dealt with, and by dealt with I mean included in the clause which waives the right of the employee to bring specific claims, the question arises whether the courts will allow the employee or ex-employee to litigate that matter in the future. So if the settlement also covers a claim that has been started and already it is slightly different, as if an employee or ex-employee tries to bring another claim in respect of the same facts, which could have been raised by that in same individual in the previous proceedings, the employee, the employer, sorry, could apply to strike that out further claim based on an abusive process but it would take an application to strike out. And so it is important the employer ensures it covers all claims the employee or ex-employee could possibly bring against the employer in the waiver of claims section in the settlement agreement. To place this second principle in context, in the past, the courts have took the approach that it was an abusive process for the court to allow new proceedings in respect of issues which were clearly part of the subject matter of an earlier claim and which clearly could have been raised in that earlier claim. However, this, this approach has evolved, and when considering such an application for an abusive process, the courts will apply the principles set out by Lord Bingham in Johnson and Gorewood. The test is as follows. Firstly, the decision is to be made by a judge as a balancing exercise, and it is not left to the discretion of the judge. And secondly, it is wrong to decide that because that matter could have been raised in earlier proceedings, it should have been. Otherwise, it will always be decided that raising um, of, of a later claim, sorry, on the same facts is an abusive process. And finally, the court will rarely find that the later claim is an abusive process unless the later action involves unjust harassment or oppression of the defendant, which in employment cases is the employer. So this case, the Johnson and Gore Wood, highlights the importance of the settlement agreement clarifying all terms in the dispute and not leaving any doors unnecessarily open for future litigation. So the third principle that I look at today is 
to determine what happens when there is an alleged breach of a settlement agreement. So in these circumstances, if one party, for example, the employee or ex-employee ignores the settlement agreement terms by continuing or commencing proceedings anyway against the employer, despite the settlement being in place, that employer can use the settlement agreement as a defence to the claim by stating that the matter has been settled or apply to stay the proceedings and argue the continuing of a claim or the commencement of it is a breach by the employee or ex-employee in any event. Additionally, where one party disputes that the settlement is not binding at all, the other can apply to court to stay all further proceedings and seek a declaration that a binding settlement has been made. So you will all be familiar with the general exclusions in a settlement agreement, and um, these have partly been covered um, in this webinar today, but there are usually three specific exclusions where an employee can bring a claim despite the settlement agreement being signed. The first is if the employer does not pay the settlement figure by the set date within the agreement, non-payment will be in breach of the contract generally formed by the settlement terms. And so the employee or ex-employee is then arguably not bound by the term set out in the settlement agreement unless there is a term keeping the agreement alive. On not being paid, the employee or ex-employee can commence a claim for payment, which could result in a cost order against the employer. The second exclusion is if the employee has a personal injury or an alleged injury which exists or is an issue at, as at the date of the settlement, the employee will want to be allowed to pursue a claim if it becomes an injury which is the fault of the employer and so it needs to be an excluded claim. That is excluded from the waiver of claims in the settlement. Whereas the employer will want to ensure the employee is aware as of as at the date of the settlement, including any known or unknown injury claim is settled. So the whole relationship has ended as at that date. As to personal injury claims, which might arise in the future, the employee will argue that they do not know what they do not know. This exclusion goes hand in hand with the warranty that should appear in the terms of the settlement, that the employee is not aware of any personal injury claim now or in the future. But if you do become aware of any personal injury to the employer, to the employee, sorry, the employer should immediately inform its personal injury insurers. The third exclusion is pension rights, which is outside the scope of this talk today. So now looking at whether a settlement agreement can be set aside at a stage where it has been signed and payments are made, but an employee or ex-employee still brings a claim. So under the law of contract, there are circumstances in which a settlement agreement may be ineffectual and it can be set aside. At common law, an agreement is invalid if either party, so the employer or employee, was induced to enter into it on the reliance of misrepresentation. It can be a misrepresentation because a mistake was made, so someone has misunderstood the facts, or because of undue influence or duress by the other side. An employment tribunal may also set aside a settlement agreement where it finds that an employer has acted in bad faith, misrepresented the true position or adopted unfair methods in concluding a settlement agreement. This is worthwhile remembering for employers in situations where they begin a process with an employee which may involve a performance issue or a redundancy and the outcome is a settlement agreement before the process has run its course. In these circumstances it's pivotal to ensure as the employer you are not misrepresenting the true position to the employee and you clearly document any business rationale or conversations you have with the employee on the record. The reasons for this is that the employee could bring a claim that you have misrepresented the facts and the employee has accepted the sum of money offered based on a misrepresentation of the facts, for example, a sham redundancy. Despite there being a settlement agreement in place, there may be the opportunity for the employee or the ex-employee to keep the money paid under the settlement agreement and claim further damages if they can show the position was misrepresented to them. As mentioned, we would always advise clearly documenting all processes you have on the record with employees to show that you have not misrepresented the facts. That being said, employees or ex-employees bringing in this type of claim is rare and they may be stuck with a cost order, thus paying a certain amount of the other side's legal fees if they have acted vexatiously, abusively, disruptively or otherwise unreasonably. So finally, looking at the general top tips to help deal with any future claims post-settlement and which employers should be thinking about pre-settlement, and they are as follows. Firstly, you should ensure you clearly document all the steps taken and reasons for doing so when dealing with employees, whether that is in a redundancy situation or otherwise, and this is to help defend any claims where an ex-employee alleges 
you acted in bad faith and misrepresented the true position to them. Secondly, always keep your insurers up to date as soon as you become aware of potential personal injury claims. Thirdly, make sure all claims to be waived by the settlement are referred to specifically in the settlement agreement and the employee or ex-employee promises. These are all the claims they have arising out of their employment or its termination if that is relevant. And fourth and finally, you need to ensure that any personal injuries the employee asserts they have or maybe occupational health has identified are not part of the claims listed in the settlement as an excluded claim carved out of the waiver of claims in the settlement. That's all from me. Okay, that, that's, that's great, John. Thanks very much. We've just got um, um, a couple of minutes left, and, and maybe what we can, and we've had no questions so far. Um, um, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, Dean. No, I, I, okay. Yeah, sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, um, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add um, um, something about um, settlement agreements and what can happen after they're signed. I mean, um, I think one tricky area is where um, an employee raises a whistleblowing complaint um, prior to settlement by means of settlement agreement. The settlement agreement can't be used as a, as, as a mechanism to gag that employee from preventing them from repeating the same whistleblowing complaint uh, or details underlying their whistleblowing complaint after they sign the settlement agreement. So um, for some employers, they will be nervous about signing up to a settlement agreement where the main incentive for them to do so was to, was to get the employee to withdraw or cease to sue, not sue them for whistleblowing and, and, and actually ideally want them to keep quiet about it, about the, the, the relevant wrongdoing that the employee was complaining about. But you, you, the settlement agreement won't, won't secure that comfort for the employer. So what other mechanisms could you use as an employer to try to achieve that? same outcome and in the past we've advised employers of staggered payments under settlement agreement such that um, it would say that uh, a percentage of the settlement money will be paid within the first 30 days or after the date of the agreement but the remaining uh, and the next tranche of a certain percentage of money will be paid th three months after uh, and then the remaining amount say six months after often you get pushed back from the individual because they'd rather have everything at the same time as soon as possible um, um, but but the idea with that behind that is that if they do go and whistleblow uh, after they, uh, as in reported to the press or some other regulator or, or some other entity, then 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 you could say, well, that was a that was a um, breach of confidentiality under the settlement agreement, and we're not paying you further instalments. I'm not saying that's foolproof. Um, but it's designed to try and incentivize them to keep quiet and hopefully that they'll then move on, find other work and just forget about the issues that they're complaining about before they left you. Um, and and um, so just so, so I think um, where we are, where we are for executives, um, sometimes one has to be slightly careful about what, what the executives will say to their employer about the strength of their whistleblowing uh, issue in, in that, you know, if you go too heavy, with it, the employer might say, well, we can't actually settle with you then because we're, we're never going to get comfort. You're going to keep quiet about this. Um, we've had, a, you know, we've had a, a situation just as you've described where um, we obviously there's a warranty in there to say there's no other issue that the individual's aware of that they can blow the whistle on or, or if there is, tell us. But um, it, it that flushed out a, a potential whistleblowing allegation. And um, we said during the period of notice that we'd work with the individual on that whistleblowing allegation in order to reach a satisfactory conclusion to it. So it then um, uh, had been dealt with. Uh, the individual's lawyer said in reply to that, well, I'm signing, I'm telling my client now to sign something that says you'll reach a satisfactory conclusion or something um, at a later date. And the way we resolved it was to say, well, it's not just us that's reaching a, reaching a satisfactory conclusion, it's you, your client's going to help us as well. Uh, they're going to be uh, uh, helping us resolve what it is they thought was the act of whistleblowing and it, and it got agreed. So um, you, you can do mm -hmm. it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I'm just conscious of time. So um, thanks everyone um, for all of your talks, all, all of your sections, they were great. And just a quick run through for me, I've just made some notes. There's so much to cover and I'm sure everyone on, on the webinar has got so much more to say about this but some potential problem areas are whistleblowing carl as you mentioned um people that like to lodge dsars as well because uh you know trying to stop people lodge a dsar if you're signing a settlement agreement and you, you do the deal and the dsar comes in and then there's a lot of disclosure new evidence is that a fresh claim and um, 
like a feature claim like Dominic's mentioned, payment straddling tax years as well, in greed in one tax year paid in the subsequent tax year, another problem area. Um, protective awards are on TP, again, at a tricky area. Um, as Carl's mentioned, multinational uh, long-term incentive plans, um, where the, the often the, the bonus scheme rules are governed by um, the law of another country, even we get a lot of them in the UK where we've got Share, uh, stock option agreements bound by the law of Delaware, and it's it's just something to I get. I'm just listing things for people to be mindful of. Um, also contractual only settlement agreements, which do not work to settle statutory claims. So I've had a case before where the employer, um, without legal advice, agreed a contractual agreement, a very basic one to two pager, uh, for a breach of contract for non-payment of wages. But then the employee brought a statutory unlawful deduction for wages claim as well. So it, all these things are different. Yeah, but problem areas and personal injury as well, and just future claims generally and confidentiality. So, um, and just lastly, as Sean has mentioned, being created with settlement agreements is something that we're all big fans of in the firm because it's not just the monetary amount that we're settling. As an employer, you've got scope to get a whole load of extra helpful things, um, particularly when you're dealing with someone who's very senior, very dangerous and very volatile and very angry. You, you just don't go for the template agreement, you know, and do get good legal advice and just make sure that you're making the settlement work for you in the non-financial as well as the financial sense as well. Um, just before we dive off, is, does anybody have anything final to say just before we close the webinar? I am going to refer to the ACAS code. Uh, oh, yeah. The code is legally binding and there's a code on settlement agreements and then a guidance to that code. The guidance is, as it says, by virtue of the name, guidance, uh, but the code is legally binding. But we'll circulate that to attendees after, after the webinar because it's, uh, yeah, it's just useful, basic information. Yeah, and, and I would say as well, I think you touched this thing already, so, um, don't, don't just also rely on a, a template as an employer, don't rely on a template settlement agreement that you may, that may have had it in your digital shell, so to speak, for 10 years or five years. It's always worth a bit of um, a sense check, a health check and get it updated um, because also with whistleblowing, there can be a mechanism where, and this is probably more for, for specific issues where whistleblowing is, is in prospect or has actually been raised, where you can try and and um, we, we weave in clauses that the employee needs to disclose any further whistleblowing complaints which they haven't previously disclosed at the point at which they settle um, internally so they don't go to an external party and, and um, sort of set out sort of parameters through, by which they need to uh, raise it with the employer. So give it some thought and, and, um, and, and um, reach out if you have any queries. Yeah, and there is wording that you can use to uh, deter uh, people bringing uh, lodging um, making prote uh, protective disclosures. Uh, there, there's certain, well, we haven't got time to go into it now, but there's certain wording you can use to put people off potentially, arguably breaching the settlement agreement and losing all the money that they want to settle for. So in the, uh, well, I shouldn't mention them today because it would be very case specific, but there are ways to kind of get control of people who are, um, you know, just a, a, bit of, um, a bit of a loose cannon, basically. And there's ways you can do that. All right, um, that's the end of the webinar. Thank you so much for attending. Um, the information we covered today uh, does not constitute formal legal advice. I should have mentioned that at the start, sorry. Um, if you do have anything specific you want to run past this, obviously drop us a line. All the contact details are on uh, www.joneschase.com. The information we covered today is accurate the 28th of July, 2022. And um, I think we're going to have a webinar break in August, but we've got a load of extra content coming out, a couple of extra five-minute videos, and also some guidance as well, um, which will be hitting you by email. And, yeah, and thanks for attending. And that's all from us today. And enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.